Welcome to episode 186 of Real Health Radio. You can find the links talked about as part of this episode at the show notes, which is www.7, so the word all spelled out, S-C-V-E-N, hyphenhealth.com forward slash 186. Seven Health is currently taking on new clients. There are a handful of reasons that clients commonly come and see us. Hypothalamic amenorrhea, uh, the fancy name for not getting a period, is one of them. And this is often the result of under-eating and over-exercising for what your body needs, uh, irrespective of your actual weight. And it's almost always coupled with body dissatisfaction and a fear of gaining weight. Disordered eating and eating disorders would be another, and we work with clients along the disordered eating and eating disorder spectrum. And some clients wouldn't think to use the term disordered eating to describe themselves, but that they see that they're overly restrictive with their eating, with fears around certain foods, whether that be bread or fat or processed food or carbs. They feel compelled to exercise excessively and or they find themselves binging and feeling out of control around food. Clients who want to move on from dieting. So clients who've had years or decades of dieting and realizing that it's just not working, but they're struggling to figure out how to do food without dieting. So what should they eat? How do they listen to their body? What will become of their weight? Like they're confused and overwhelmed. They just don't know what to do. And then body dissatisfaction and negative body image would be the final one. And many of our clients experience feelings of body shame and hatred, and they find themselves fixated on weight and determined to be a particular size and frustrated by what they see in the mirror. And they may even avoid social events or opt out of photographs or put off appointments as a result of negative body thoughts. In all these areas, we're able to help and do so through a mix of understanding physiology and psychology. So understanding how to support the physical body and how it works, but also being compassionate and uncovering the whys behind clients' behavior and figuring out how to change this. So if any of these are areas that you want help with, then please get in contact. You can head over to www.7-health.com forward slash help, so H-E-L-P, and there you can read about how we work with clients and apply for a free initial chat. So the address again is www.7-health.com forward slash help, and I'll also include that in the show notes. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Real Health Rodeo. I'm your host, Chris Sandal. So there's three things I want to mention before getting started with today's show. Um, The first is that we now have a resources page on the website. So this is actually something I've been wanting to create for a long time, but it just never, never materialized until now. And this is going to be a constant working progress. And as we continue to find more resources, we will continue to add to it. As we read more books and find more books that we like, we'll continue to add to it. And this is going to be a place that you can find books or blogs to help you on your journey. And so I recommend checking it out. You can go to www.com. 7-health.com forward slash resources, or if you go to the the menu navigation in the top left-hand corner, um, resources will be one of the the options there. Uh, The second thing is we are going to start doing giveaways each week on the show. So Real Health Radio has been running for four and a half years, and over this time we've had some ratings and reviews on iTunes but not that many in the whole scheme of things. And this is largely because I've never actually asked for it, or I think on, I don't know, two or three occasions out of those last four and a half years have I actually asked for it. And so on many podcasts I listen to, with every episode, there is a request for a rating and a review. And I've always been fairly against this. Like this podcast is pretty stripped back as much as possible. I try to just get on with the show. I hate listening to podcasts and having to start a podcast, skipping through five or 10 or 15 minutes of adverts and the host talking about their life. I mean, there are a a few exceptions to this, but the majority of the time I find it incredibly annoying. Uh, But I've also been made painfully aware of just how important ratings and reviews are and that by missing out on them, we're missing out on lots of people discovering the podcast. And so for me, that really sucks. So I wanted to try and find a compromise with this, so a way to increase ratings and reviews, but to take up as little time as possible, 
and to give people a genuine incentive to do so uh, on, on top of the fact that they that they really like the show. So what we're going to do is do a giveaway each show. When you leave a rating and review, please email it over to info at sevenhealth.com and then at Each week with every show, we will pick one person who has left a review and then we will send them a free book. So they get to pick anything from the resources list and we will then send it to them. So that is what is going to be going on moving forward. And I will promise to keep it as quick as possible so we can then just get on with the the show. But it's a way that I can say thank you for leaving a rating review to give people a chance to get books that they might not otherwise buy for themselves Uh, but yeah that's what's going to be going on and then the final thing is at the end of each episode I'm going to start to give out some recommendations of things that I've read or watched or listened to that I think people may be interested in and this is something I do during my end of year roundup uh, but there's only so much you can cover in one show And a lot of this is actually going to be completely unrelated to the topics covered on this podcast. Like, it's interesting when I'm working with clients, I actually end up making lots of recommendations of non-health and non-recovery type stuff that they can be checking out. So clients are so entrenched in that stuff and, and for good reason, they find it very valuable and supportive, but they're often wanting to just read or watch something totally unrelated whether it be for pleasure, for laughter, to to widen their understanding of the world. And that's actually what I spend so much of my own time consuming. Like it's, it's funny, I was having a conversation with my dad when we were home at Christmas. And my dad is a lawyer and he deals mostly in contract law and so a lot of wills and dealing with estates. And it all sounds very tedious to me, but he enjoys it and is very thorough and has the, the right kind of mind and temperament for that sort of work. But because he spends all his day reading contracts and very dense material, when he's not at work, he often reads the complete opposite. So he loves crime thrillers and gets through them in in record time. And after a day of heavy reading, he wants something different. And in some ways, I'm the same. I spend so much of my day living and breathing everything to do with health and nutrition and eating disorders and recovery that's when it's time for me to put on a podcast or watch something or read a book, I typically want something that is unrelated or relatively unrelated uh, that I then try and shoehorn into how it becomes relevant to what I do. So all this is to say from now on in the outro, I will be giving recommendations. And if you don't care for that stuff, you can simply stop listening. And at least that way it's at the end and you don't have to skip through anything or sit through anything. So that is it for the housekeeping. Let's get on with the focus of the actual show. So today is a guest interview and my guest is Dr. Jeffrey Hunger. So Dr. Hunger is an assistant professor of psychology at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, where he is the director of the Stigma and Health Lab. He completed his PhD in social psychology at UC Santa Barbara, followed by postdoctoral training in health uh, psychology at UCLA, and his current research focuses primarily on mental and physical health effects of weight sigma. So I first became aware of Jeff probably a couple of years ago, I I think when doing my own research on weight sigma and finding one of his papers, or it might have been hearing him on someone's podcast, and then I went to find papers after that. Uh, But once I found his work, I, I really went through everything I could find. And he just presents such compelling data of why weight stigma is a problem and and what these problems are and how they occur. And I actually did a solo episode on weight stigma that you can check out. It's episode 140. And the plan when I did that episode was actually to do a, a part two and a part three and just go through different papers as part of each of those different episodes Uh, which up until this point hasn't hasn't, uh, materialised. But I'm hoping that this episode with Jeff is a good substitute for that as we cover the topic in in a fair amount of depth. Uh, I cover in the intro um, how I'm going to structure the show, so I, I won't repeat it here. But as part of the conversation, we look at some of the erroneous assumptions around weight and health. 
We cover how weight stigma affects physiology and psychology and behavior. We talk about social identity threat and how this connects to, to weight stigma. We cover healthism, what it is, why it's important to understand, and if we're moving to a more weight neutral place, why we don't want the new discrimination to be around health or, or the lack thereof. And we talk about making research and journals more accessible to the lay public and making it easier for people to read and understand. And it's really just me complimenting Jeff on the excellent work that he's done with his papers in really being able to do that. And I should say that I feel like I sound a little dull in this interview. I actually really enjoyed this conversation, but I went, when I went to re-listen to it again, my voice doesn't sound so upbeat. And this was recorded shortly after I got back from traveling and I was fairly jet lagged. Um, this was also mixed with Ramsey being really unwell. And so I'd had some poor night sleep because of him too. So if I sound like I've taken a tranquilizer, uh, you, you know why. So this, that is it for this super long intro. Uh, the, the irony of mentioning I like to keep my intros and shows stripped back and then get straight into it. And then I do the complete opposite here. But here is my conversation with Dr. Jeffrey Hunger. Hey, Dr. Hunger, thanks for joining me on the show today. I'm really excited to be chatting with you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. So I've invited you on the show because I want to chat about weight stigma. So this is an area of speciality as a researcher for you, and you've been involved in a number of studies looking at weight stigma and being the author or, or co-author on numerous papers. And I'm going to use a handful of these papers to guide our conversation, but I'm also just happy to touch whatever other topics or ideas come up. So don't feel you need to stay sort of on this narrow path. Um, but before we start with the papers, let's start with you and your background. Are you able to give a brief bio of sorts, like who you are, or what you've done study-wise, that kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my training and background is in social psychology, which is the area of psychology that studies how our social worlds impact our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So obviously, and I'm completely unbiased here, social psychologists tackle some of the most interesting questions. <laughs> uh, uh, and so after I completed my PhD in social psychology, I spent a few years at UCLA doing postdoctoral training in health psychology, because in my lab in particular, we're really interested in the mental and physical health effects of being in a stigmatized group. And for the better part of the last decade, kind of like you alluded to earlier, I focused a lot of this work on weight stigma in particular. And so for folks out there that aren't you know, fully versed in the weight stigma literature, weight stigma encompasses broadly the very pervasive stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination that's directed at higher body weight individuals. And so when you were first starting, so obviously you, you started with a, just a Bachelor of Psychology, did you always know that you were then going to go in that way in terms of doing social psychology or like what, what was your intention? Was it always to be a researcher? So yeah, from a very early on uh, part in my sort of undergraduate career, I realized that I wanted to be a researcher in psychology. I actually transferred schools to pursue that. Uh, so, and this was my second year in undergraduate, I realized that social psychology, even though I didn't have the language for it at the time, was what I was interested in. I was really interested in how our social interactions and our social worlds influence us psychologically. It wasn't actually until late in my second year in undergraduate that I realized that that was actually an entire sub-discipline of psychology. So, I knew from a, a pretty early on stage that I wanted to be a social psychology researcher but it wasn't sort of until the under or the, the end of my undergraduate career that I realized that being a researcher in the stigma field and in particularly stigma and health was of interest to me. Uh, before that, I was interested in things like impression management, which is how people convey certain aspects of their identities to different groups. Or I was interested in personality and how people differ on personality characteristics but it was my, I think my sophomore or my senior year, I read a paper on uh, the stigma associated with higher body weight written by Rebecca Poole. And it just changed my research direction for 
the past ooh, 10 or 11 years now. I read that paper on weight stigma, could see how it fit with the ways that we think about identity and social psychology. And that just sort of kind of launched a brand new trajectory from that point onward. And had you had an interest, I mean, obviously weight stigma is quite a niche thing, but just in terms of the, the, the health side of things, had that been something you'd always been interested in? Yeah, so I had a sort of a background in biology. My first major before psychology, uh, like many people who started out pre-med, <laughs> was biology. Uh, but it was sort of fortuitous that when I came across that paper, uh, the weight stigma paper by Rebecca Poole, at the same time, I was actually managing a health psychology lab. I was Tracy Mann's lab manager because she had just recently moved to the university where I was doing my undergraduate degree. And so here I am running this lab dedicated to, you know, sort of health psychology broadly, but really the psychology of eating and dieting. And I come across this fantastic paper about weight stigma. And it was just sort of this confluence of things at this moment that made, it, made me realize that this was the direction I wanted to go and that these areas of research really needed to be melded, needed to be synthesized together. And for you, I mean, growing up was like, was, was dieting or, or the things that were then kind of touching weight stigma, was that something that had impacted upon you? Not particularly. Uh, I think like many, uh, at least young Americans, we can point to parents who engaged in dieting behavior. Like I could see that to some extent uh, in my mom or older, um, like sort of uh, female family members, but it wasn't something that impacted me in particular, but it was something that I was always interested in. I was always interested in uh, sort of the psychology of eating, the psychology of exercise, and had never really considered how social experiences like stigma and discrimination might actually shape those behaviors. I sort of saw them operating in these two separate worlds. And so it was, it was certainly that aha moment to see them come together uh, sort of that last year of undergraduate. And so what, just so I can have a sense of what year did you say that was that you came across that paper? It would have been, I mean, we're talking a decade ago at this point, so I believe it's about 2009. Uh, okay. The, it was towards the end of my undergraduate career, and it's a paper by Rebecca Poole, and uh, I'm neglecting the co-author's name at this point. I feel terrible. But yeah, it was a 2009 publication that really shifted my views on what I wanted to pursue in graduate school. And so, I mean, you, that's, as you say, going back a, a decade it feels like the concept of weight stigma is making it much more into the public consciousness and probably in the last couple of years in the way it hadn't before. And maybe I'm just biased around that. Um, and undoubtedly you've had a, a hand in this happening, but when you first started into this area, did it feel like it was this tiny niche or was there already this growing awareness around it? Honestly, I, I agree with you. I think it's, it felt like a sort of a novel and sort of niche area of research. Uh, there was certainly no one in mainstream social psychology conducting that research at the time. And so when my graduate advisor and I started to brainstorm ideas and come up with you know, grant proposals and things like that, there wasn't a ton of research in psychology or social psychology to draw on. But I do think that we have that 2009 paper by Rebecca Poole to thank for launching this just broad, like growing, burgeoning, and very broad uh, sort of field of weight stigma because it, it cuts across disciplines, which is really fascinating. Um, it's one of the few areas of research that are really, you know, effectively de-siloed. There's not just, you know, psychologists talking about it. There's psychologists, there's uh, anthropologists like Alex Brewis at, uh, I believe, Arizona State, who's, uh, you know, approaching it from an anthropological perspective. There are just folks in, there are folks in public health, social work. It really resonated with people. And I haven't looked recently, but I think the last time I checked, that paper has been cited like upwards of like 3,000 times since 2009, which is incredibly wow. impressive. And I know in, in one of the papers that we're going to go through, you, you talk about 
the attacks on on Catherine Flagel that she's received. And for, for people who don't know who she is, she, she's a scientist with, with the CDC that's published a number of papers or articles challenging some of the you know, in, embedded beliefs around weight and, and health. And so I just want to find, like, how have you personally fared? Are, are you someone who receives criticism or, or pushback based on your research and publications? So one thing that I learned uh, very early is to never read the comments on any sort of <laughs> any sort of public uh, like sort of news article about my work, and to absolutely never search myself on Reddit. Uh, <laughs> Those are the two things that I've come to uh, realize early on in my career that they will help my uh, my mental well-being. Because, I mean, it, the criticism that I've faced has not nearly been as, you know, prominent and widespread as uh, Kathy Flegel has faced because that was, you know, in the large media and the comments were coming from very prominent uh, figures in nutrition and public health. But, yeah, we certainly get a lot of pushback. Uh, even very early on in pursuing this research, we got pushback from funding agencies who thought that weight stigma should be an effective tool for health promotion. So why would we be pursuing research that is counter to that? Why would we be framing our research as something that possibly suggests that weight stigma is not an effective tool for changing behavior because it should work? And so thankfully, over the past decade, we've seen sort of a shift in, in how at least you know, funding agencies think about stigma as a health promotion tool. But the challenge is we still face a lot of public pushback in terms of our findings. And I think oftentimes as a social psychologist or a psychologist in general, trying to push into the public health sphere or the medical sphere and raise these questions or push back against sort of the dogma there, we still are up against a, up against a wall to some extent. Yeah. And is there research coming out that counters what you're saying? And so like, it's, it's one thing that it's just dogma or hearsay or bias that people have, but are there people who are publishing papers that run counter to, to some of the things that you're saying? Yeah, I think, and this is sort of how we structured the the assumptions in uh, you know the, the one of the papers you're interested on evidence based rationale for weight inclusive health policies is you can find these relationships say between uh, weight and poor health. There are papers out there that exist that show that that relationship uh, can be found, but it often overlooks a lot of third variables that aren't weight causing poor mental and physical health. You know, this is sort yeah. of one of the arguments that we make is yes, you can sort of find this correlation between uh, body weight and poor mental and physical health. And it is just a correlation. And so this leaves us open to alternative explanations that for the most part, aren't pursued by researchers who are coming at this relationship from the perspective that weight is and always will be a predictor of poorer health. So I would just love to see a lot, you know, a lot of these uh, studies that come out control for things like, you know, the weight stigma that folks that have uh, experienced. Yeah. But if that's not in the data set, because it's likely not, you know, this is one of the challenges of operating with secondary data. Why don't you just control for stress? You know, that's a that's a good proxy. Stress and depression would be good proxies for weight stigma because we know that weight stigma is a large and significant predictor of both stress and depression. Yeah. And so I would just love to see these researchers adopt a, a perspective on the relationship between weight and health that is more agnostic to the outcome. Yeah. I guess with, with my original question, it was more around there's people publishing papers that show in this scenario, weight stigma is beneficial. Oh, no. <laughs> I <laughs> okay. apologize about mis uh, mis misperceiving that question. No, there are, uh, there are, for the most part, I can only think of one paper that has shown sort of salubrious effects of weight stigma, and it's in a very small, very self-selected sample. And there are about seven or eight other papers that directly contradict its findings on you know, specific outcomes related to weight changes or health behaviors. 
there's the the literature, at least from the weight stigma side, is pretty consistent that weight stigma is going to be a negative predictor of mental and physical health, uh, of you know anxiety, depression, stress, various health behaviors. As far as I know, and I after that uh, latest paper, feel like I have a fairly strong grasp on the extant literature, which is growing and growing. I can't seem to see much research that suggests that there's any positive benefits of weight stigma. Okay. So, so at least there is a fairly solid consensus on that. It's just all of the other moving parts that then connect into that where there seems to be more disagreement and blind spots. Yes, absolutely. But I think on the weight stigma side of things, it is a fairly consistent and fairly robust literature showing that those that experience weight stigma are at risk for poor mental and physical health and even uh, mortality. There's a really, a really compelling paper by uh, Angelina Sutton in Psych Science longitudinally linking weight stigma to mortality risk. So look, what I want to do is just go through, as I said, like some of the papers that you've been involved in. And there are two main papers that I want to use as, as a jumping off point. One's called an evidence-based rationale for adopting weight inclusive health policy. And then the other is called Weigh Down by Stigma, how weight-based social identity threat contributes to weight gain and poor health. And so look, I'll link to both of these in the show notes as well as any other papers we make reference to today, and you can access it all as well on, on Jeff's site, uh, which is jeffreyhunger.com. Um, so, yeah, let's start with the paper in evidence-based rationale for adopting weight-inclusive health policy. So as part of this, you go through a number of misguided assumptions, and I, I want to just walk through each of these, and then you can comment on why they're misguided and, and what you found as part of putting together this paper. So assumption number one is that higher body weight equals poor health. Yeah, and I think we kind of just touched on that a little bit, uh, that there is this you know, sort of existing, existing correlation between body weight and health that occasionally uh, manifests, but that relationship is complicated. We don't consistently see uh, that it is a linear relationship between body weight and health. And as I mentioned before, it overlooks the consequences that come along with, at least the social consequences that come along with being in a higher body weight in a fat phobic society. So this is encountering weight stigma, which itself is associated with a whole host of psychological and physiological stress consequences, changes in eating behaviors, changes in physical activity, you know, elevated risk for anxiety and depression and other mood disorders, a whole host of things that we know are strong predictors of poor health over time. So if we don't account for those, we can't be certain that the relationship between weight and health is just this direct one, like a lot of uh, researchers would like to assume or would like to assert. Um, and relatedly, it overlooks sort of uh, really compelling work showing that things like poor body image, which you know are wrapped up in weight stigma more broadly, but that poor body image itself is associated with outcomes like greater inflammation and type 2 diabetes risk. There's some really newer and compelling research in this area. Uh, yeah, so that to me, that relationship <clears throat> is tenuous at best, and you know we need more direct research that is looking at these very plausible factors that could confound that relationship or explain it. I'm just wondering, is there? I'm, I'm trying to think of places around the world that don't have the same thoughts around weight. Um, and weight stigma in the, in the same way. So I know a lot of time people make reference to like Mauritania where women are fed more food and their, their kind of beauty ideals are for a, a bigger body. Um, so I'm just wondering like are there, are there locations around the world that could have different beliefs around what weight means and what ideals are where you could kind of test some of this stuff? You know, that is, to me, that's sort of the million dollar question of like how we could get access to this data because I think it's a really, a really fascinating question. But one of the challenges is that in today's modern technological world, we've done a very fantastic job, unfortunately, exporting this Western ideal of thinness uh, and this Western ideal of glorifying thin bodies over fatter bodies. But I do think that there are places like you bring up 
uh, where we might be able to find folks with less strong links between weight and sort of cultural worth where we could test these questions. Uh, there's, again, this is maybe a paper I can try to send you, but I believe there's a paper by Peter, Peter Munig uh, from a while ago, maybe 2009, 2010, showing that in a culture that had less strong um, cultural assumptions related to the body hierarchy, and that actually I think was more, uh, more of a culture that uh, – saw higher body weight individuals as more valued. The relationship between weight and blood pressure or weight and self-reported health was uh, attenuated. And so that would be some very suggestive early evidence to sort of what you're suggesting. But I think it is kind of wide open. And this is uh, an area of research that would be fascinating to team up with folks like, you know, cultural anthropologists at ASU that I mentioned earlier to see if we can find existing sort of cultures or subcultures that have that don't show the same relationship between weight and health or don't show the same relationship between weight stigma and health. Yeah. I think, I mean, with Mauritania, if, if you're force feeding people, I think there's probably some, some added problems that are coming along <laughs> that, would, that would confound things there. Um, and I, I have made reference on this podcast before to the, to the Fiji study in terms of where you had, um, a prizing of bigger bodies that was very quickly eradicated as soon as television came in. So I, I agree. I think you're you're going to struggle a lot more to find places that have been untarnished by uh, the exporting of of Western ideals. Absolutely. Uh, and while I have this up, uh, so the the Munich paper that I was referring to was in 2009. It looks like, and it looked like a small region in Dominican Republic was where they had surveyed folks. There was a small community in the Dominican Republic that uh, had sort of these similar body ideals that you're talking about. So I can send you that link as well, so that we can link to it in the the, um, the show notes. Perfect. So then the assumption two that you talk about in the paper is long term weight loss is widely achievable. Yeah, so I this we see this uh, very frequently. Uh, perhaps more for those that are embedded in sort of diet culture, uh, that weight is something that's <clears throat> under individual control. We can lose you know significant amounts of weight, and that we can keep that weight off in the long term. And I think that most all of those are challenged by existing science, particularly that long-term weight loss is achievable. Uh, we see this from meta-analyses looking at um, dieting. So one of, his, one of the meta-analyses in particular is uh, my co-author Janet's um, from 2007 with Tracy Mann and colleagues. You know, They find that uh, for the most part, short-term weight loss is achievable. We can we could have an entire conversation here about what, you know, constitutes clinically significant short-term weight loss, but we'll save that for a different day. Um, but, uh, in the long term, you know, most everybody that loses weight in the short term gains it back in a significant portion actually gain back more than they lost. And there's this really compelling, uh, paper by, Oh, Allison Fildes in American Journal of Public Health that shows or sort of talks about the probability of higher body weight individuals returning to um, a quote unquote normal body weight range. So they look at what's the probability of people that have a higher BMI returning to a lower BMI that the government uh, considers quote unquote healthy, which we know is a little bit um, incorrect or a lot incorrect depending on which day you catch me on. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, the probability for folks that are in the quote-unquote overweight uh, range is 1 in 200, and it jumps to something like 1 in 1,200 for folks that are in the quote-unquote, still using that because I hate the BMI, you know, the obese BMI range. And for those listening, I only use those terms when we're talking very specifically about those categories. You can look to a lot of my work where I have a large bone to pick with the BMI in general and those categories and their labels. But for the most part, the data just suggests that long-term weight loss, is at least a significant amount, 
uh, just is not achievable for the the overwhelming majority of people. There will, of course, be outliers. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that there's no one that has ever done it. Yeah. But then that leads to a second question: Is how has that changed their quality of life? Are these folks that are restricting day in and day out to maintain that that weight loss? Are they engaging in unhealthy weight control behaviors or disordered eating behaviors to maintain that weight loss? Like, what are the other consequences for it for their mental and physical health, other than just weight suppression? And I think also the the long term piece is I think it feels like it's more doable because you catch someone a month afterwards or six months afterwards or, or whatever. And so you're like, oh, everyone's able to do this, but it, it's it's much rarer that you're then catching someone who's 10 years on who has been able to do that. And I think that's sort of one of the insidious aspects of diet culture is that that's when we capture people's like awful before and afters. And that really reinforces this idea to others who are viewing it that weight is controllable you know they see it as something that that person over there just lost 40 pounds in six weeks because they haven't you know so much as walked past a carb um but it doesn't really look toward the long term even a year out let alone true long-term follow-ups of two three four five years Yeah. And I think even, I mean, you were alluding to this, I imagine, in terms of what constitutes weight loss or significant weight loss, it's now something like 5% or 10% is is enough to consider like weight has been lost as part of a study. Is that correct? Yeah. So I believe the most recent uh, like quote unquote success stories for weight loss studies is 5%. Yeah. And which, and, and then it has, Over the past 20 or 30 years in that literature, you see that number slowly creeping down as it becomes more and more evident that larger weight losses are just not sustainable. So you, in the 80s and 90s, we're talking about people that are saying 20% is clinically significant or 20% is that success story. And then it was 15, then it was 10, and now it's five. And then now you'll even see weight loss trials keep the weight loss frame, but basically make the argument that we're trying to make that, well, they didn't lose weight, but their, their health improved. Well, that was because their health behaviors changed probably on your diet. Not only are they eating healthier perhaps, but they're probably exercising or maybe finding a more mindful relationship with their body and, and what they're putting in it. It's, it's just really interesting to see uh, the goalposts consistently change from uh, folks that are still embedded in the weight loss model. Yeah, definitely. And so then the assumption number three is weight loss results uh, in uh, consistent uh, weight loss results in consistent improvement in physical health. Yeah. uh, I think one of the easiest articles to point to here is, again, uh, to my esteemed co-author, Janet Tomiyama. She has a meta-analysis in 2013 that basically approaches this question. It says, okay, if even let, let's assume that you argue weight loss is possible, what if we go out and we look at all the literature and see how much the weight that you lost is associated with improvements in physical health? Because if it truly is something about the weight that you lost, that should be a predictor of improvements in physical health. You know, we're talking about things like blood pressure, cholesterol, triglycerides, risk for all sorts of uh, physical ailments. And so they sought out to do this and review the literature and basically found no relationship between the amount of weight lost and improvements in health. And so to me, that says that it's not about the weight that was lost on whatever you know, regimen you were a part of or whatever study you were into, it's really about the health behavior changes that come along with it. Yeah. And and how was that paper taken by, I don't know, researchers at large? Was was there pushback on that? Uh, so I don't know how it's been received since, but I do know from, you know, having been a collaborator with Janet for the better part of the past 12 years, I do know that before it ended up at its current uh, journal that it's published in, 
it was severely, it was very harshly reviewed by other journals uh, that were in more medically oriented outcomes or medically oriented journals, excuse me. I think in part because it pushed back against existing beliefs about weight loss and health improvements. And so I know that it was a challenge to actually get that paper published. And as a researcher who, you know, comes at these sort of relationships from a not traditional perspective, that's a little scary that important papers like this, which is, you know, this is not data that Janet and her team generated. This was just a review of existing published data if that can get suppressed or can get tanked because certain reviewers are invested in a certain way the science should go, that should be alarming. It should be concerning for all of us. Yeah. And so then the next one was stigmatizing weight will promote weight loss and improved health. Yeah. So this sort of touches back onto what we talked about earlier and the approach that a lot of people have taken to weight stigma as a public health promotion tool. I think about uh, nine or 10 years ago, that was still the predominant view was that, you know, higher body weight individuals just need to be stigmatized and shamed and it's for their own good. It's quote unquote for their own good because what it's going to do, it's going to spur behavior change or it's going to spur weight loss. That's going to result in improvements in health. And, you know, over the past 10 years now, we've shown it from our lab and maybe five or six other labs have shown it that individuals who experience weight stigma are actually more likely to gain weight over time and are more likely to show decrements in mental and physical health over time. So just like completely flies in the face of this assumption. And it's this assumption that you would have seen sort of implicitly in health promotion campaigns uh, years ago. You know, there are some very harsh health promotion campaigns that like, so for example, the, the CRUK uh, health campaigns, I know received a lot of uh, pushback in the UK. This is the cancer research UK. Are you familiar with these ads, Chris? Yeah. Where they put like a BC on a, a cigarette packet, that one. Yeah. So these were, these are sort of uh, great examples of Research, uh, excuse me, of public health campaigns that are sort of implicitly trying to leverage stigma and leverage uh, s- sort of those negative feelings associated with uh, shame and thinking that that's going to motivate health behavior change. And we, we've seen it here in the U.S. as well, uh, less so as the conversation on this side of the pond has gotten very loud about them. Like uh, folks have been criticized widely. I know that from my perspective, the CRUK advertisements were criticized, at least in online forums. I'm curious to hear, were they discussed at all a lot in sort of the lay community in the UK? The, I mean, they entered into all of the the papers and it was discussed that way. I mean, it's hard because I'm biased. So my news feed is made up uh, or my Facebook feed is made up by people who work in this industry. I, I know um, Laura Thomas. I've had her on my podcast before and she was really trying to spearhead a lot of that and, and wrote an open letter. She then sat down with um, Cancer UK and and so it felt like Lots of people were talking about it, but I don't know if that's just because I was living in a bubble where it felt like people were talking about it. Yeah, I I suppose that actually could be my own experience too. I may just have a Twitter echo chamber that is (laughs) uh, full of folks that are involved in the body image and weight stigma spheres and so that we've had those conversations. But I think we've, you know, we've, we've seen this over the past 10 years, this assumption play out in, you know, either policies or public health campaigns but over the past 10 years, you know, we've shown fairly consistently that this is just not true. Weight stigma is not going to promote weight loss. If it does spur the motivation to lose weight, it's because people are motivated to avoid being stigmatized. Out of, you know, if it makes people more likely to engage or motivates weight loss, it's because it's going to lead them to engaging in these drastic forms of unhealthy weight control behaviors and disordered eating as a way to escape the stigma that they know is associated with being a higher body weight individual. So even if it does, quote unquote, increase motivation, 
it's not increasing a healthy form of health motivation. It's increasing this, I need to get out of this fat body because I am constantly a source of denigration and a source of stigma. Yeah. And I would say for the majority of people who have that feeling in terms of impacting on health behaviors, either it's A, as you talk about it, it leads to really disordered behaviors, or it's pretty fleeting in terms of creating healthy behaviors. And then someone gets right back to what was going on before or leads to worse, to, to worse choices because of just being stigmatized and, and the stress response that that causes. Yeah, or leading you to do things to avoid stigma. So, you know, you can imagine a higher body weight person who's, you know, physically active, always at the gym, but the gym for the most part is a negative space for fat individuals. And so that stigma might just actually lead them to engage in less physical activity than they were before. And so whether it's, you know, undermining their motivation or, their desire to engage in health promoting behaviors or leading to a whole host of health compromising behaviors, it's, it's net effect is terrible for mental and physical health. Yeah. And I think I saw that play out last year in terms of the Nike campaign when Nike had bigger mannequins and people were, were talking about how terrible this is and it's, it's promoting obesity. And I just, I'm like, you, you can't win. Like you, you're either, you're in a bigger body and it's your own fault and that's why you need to exercise. But then at the same time you're told, well, don't exercise in anything that, uh, that we can see you in or that that has Nike on the, on, on the, the leggings or whatever. Like it was just, it, I couldn't get my head around it. Well, so to me, it's a really fantastic example of this, of uh, concern trolling. You know, they, this is not about, wanting to you know do what's good for their own health quote unquote this is this really it sort of pulled the curtains back on weight stigma of on no you just want to generally shit on fat people yeah and so that's why they can't have it both ways and so you just want to express your bias in a way that seems socially acceptable because you can couch it in well you know what i'm really concerned for their health yeah and so that's why I'm kind of being an asshole. Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry if I, I don't know if I can you, swear you on here. You can swear as much as you like. Okay. Because uh, I feel like uh, I uh, have a tendency to swear a little bit and I'm trying to dial it back. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think that, that that instance in particular, the the Nike case with the uh, higher body weight mannequins really kind of revealed people's biases that this was clearly not anything ever related to promoting the health of those that reside in a fat body. It was really just, you want to denigrate them and you want to put them down. Yeah. It was just showing sort of the moralizing that we have around, around bodies and weight and and what people should look like. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, And in the paper, you also made reference to legislation in, in Reykjavik um, in Iceland, which, which I hadn't heard about. So do you want to just talk a little about this in terms of stigmatizing weight and, and what they've done there? So, uh, I will say that uh, Jocelyn Smith was our policy expert on that paper, so she would probably have a stronger um, sense of the Reykjavik uh, policies. But it might actually be a fantastic guest on the on the podcast. She's the one of the policy directors at the National Eating Disorders Association here in the U.S. Okay. and was a fantastic uh, a fantastic addition to that paper because she brought into focus all the really important policy-related things that uh, this research was relevant to. But effectively, it banned discrimination on the basis of body weight and shape. And it did it, what I found uh, really fascinating, was really from a social justice perspective. And because other places that have tried to get legal protections for higher body weight individuals, at least here in the U.S., there have been a few attempts have couched it within the um, uh, what we would have as the Americans with Disabilities Act, and so they really use the um, the disease and disability model, which I know that a lot of fat activists push push back to push back against. Excuse me. Um, so what was really novel and really interesting about the Reykjavik perspective was that it was rooted not in needing to protect higher body weight, body weight individuals because they are a disabled class. 
it was rooted in social justice and equality. And I think that it really gives a nice roadmap or a nice template for how other countries and other municipalities can go about leveraging those respective laws in their countries to make way to protected class. And maybe you're not going to go know the answer to this, um, <laughs> but ha- do you know how it's then impacted upon their, I don't know, their, their public health policies and, and the way that they then talk about those things? Because it sounds like if that's what they've got as their kind of foundation, it would then be great to see how they're then tackling or talking about different issues that are affecting the, the health of their um, of their population. I wish, yeah, I wish I, I wish I had data on that, or I wish I had uh, more information on that. But I, we haven't really seen how it's played out because it's also, you know, adopting that ordinance was recent. I, I want to say it was late 2016 or 2017, okay. and so seeing once that law is was in place, it would be really, it would be a really interesting test case to see how health promotion policies have changed, uh, have shifted in a way that's more health inclusive or weight inclusive. It would also be really interesting to think about how attitudes related to body weight have shifted in the country after that was adopted. Because we know that one of the ways that stigma is perpetuated is through laws and institutions. So if your government is saying Body weight diversity is important. Discrimination faced by, you know, folks that don't tip don't fit your typical mold of what a person should look like is outlawed. What does that convey to the citizens of Iceland? And what are the consequences of that for their attitudes over time? Because you can imagine that this could sort of have this upward positive spiral for the health of higher body weight individuals in Iceland. And that is Fascinating, and I'm writing that down now because I never thought about that. Okay. Um, you know, you can think about in many ways this could have had positive impact on higher body weight individuals, at least in Reykjavik, because what it's doing is it's signaling from the government to the higher body weight individuals that they're protected, that they are worthy, and that they are, um, that they're sort of. A, a, excuse me, that their bodies are respected and, and deserve uh, equal treatment, yeah. and which is going to convey all, a whole host of things related to their sense of belongingness in the city, their lack of loneliness, things like that. At the same time, if these changes in these laws shift how they're interacting with others at the interpersonal level, it's going to have an even more positive effect. So perhaps these laws translate not only into heavier individuals feeling more accepted and like they belong in the society, they actually come to be, you know, treated less negatively and feel that at the interpersonal level as well. So it, 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 it sort of, going back to your original question, I have no clue, but it leaves <laughs> open this really interesting data set for, you know, the next few years for someone to hop onto and really track. Yeah. And I also like, just from, from what you said there, I think, over the long term, that then has an impact. So I'm trying to think of other changes in legislation in terms of you know, gay rights, that kind of thing of, of when laws are changed, then over the longer term, that then just becomes more normalised and then there's like there's the less stigma attached to all of that. Yeah, and uh, Mark Hatzenbuehler, who's a, a stigma researcher at Columbia, actually has a lot of very fascinating research on that specific topic related to changes in LGBT protections and how changes in what he calls structural stigma, you know, so laws or policies that either affirm uh, LGBT rights or that actively take them away can translate into mental and physical health for, you know, the LGBT individuals in those states or in those providences. And it's really incredibly compelling work that suggests that a lot of a lot of the ways in which stigma gets under the skin to affect health is, you know, at the top is from these policies, from these broader institutional things. And that was partially why I was motivated to write this paper on weight inclusive health policy, because 
I'm used to just talking about these things at the personal and interpersonal level. But, yeah. you know, as years go by, you start to see that how they unfold outside of interpersonal, more community and, you know, national levels is so important because as much as we can do to eradicate weight stigma at the individual level, it's going to be really hard if people are still operating in a fat phobic society when it comes to our cultural norms, our cultural laws, and how we're socialized as a culture. And so I've really been pushing myself to broaden what I think about when it comes to my research and broaden the ways that I think we can use what we know at the interpersonal level about stigma to sort of shape these bigger conversations. Yeah. And I think one of the things that we talked about sort of off mic before we started was I really liked this paper because it was really readable. And there's another paper that we're going to go through in in a little while as well that I also found really readable. And I I think there is a real problem with academia in terms of writing academia for academics when actually there is so much value in the lay public being able to read a paper like this and being able to to understand it and seeing the importance of it. Um, And, yeah, you just did a really good job of making that accessible. I love to hear that. And I agree wholeheartedly that, you know, we have an issue of even getting siloed in our language within one discipline. You know, sometimes we get stuck in our theories and our framing and our language that psychologists can't even talk to public health people and sociologists or anthropologists, let alone communicate effectively to non-experts, to lay individuals that are just really interested in the research that we have and thinking about how it impacts their day-to-day life. And so we were very very conscious about that when we wrote this paper. That was partially because of the editorial guidance at the journal. They really wanted this to be an accessible piece, you know, a comprehensive, well-researched, well-cited piece, but, you know, make it accessible. And that was the same with the paper that you sort of alluded to that we'll cover next. Equally at that journal, they were interested in making sure that the way we were writing was, you know, it was comprehensive. It was well-sourced, but it wasn't designed to only be read by the five or six other people that are in your tiny research niche. And I mean, from a writing perspective, is that easier to do with papers like this because it wasn't talking about a specific study and you didn't have to go through methodology and all of that? Or do do you think it's still achievable regardless of what the paper is? I think... I think it should be the goal, regardless of what the paper is. I think that when it comes to things like the methods and the results, you can't do much to sexy up a a methodological approach. Uh, And you really don't want to. That's the part of the paper that is specifically for the other researchers or should be. It should be telling the other researchers, how exactly did you go about doing this if we want to, say, try to replicate it? Or if we want to follow up. And so that's going to be a chunk of, you know, an original empirical paper that might not, might re- might not resonate as much with non-experts or folks not in psychology. But I think we can still write the introductions and we can still write the discussions to our papers in an accessible way that conveys sort of the gist of the paper, even if the, you know, the audience doesn't have training in the statistical or methodological approaches that you know, we've taken. It does, it does uh, sort of make them have to fully trust that we've done the methods and statistics correctly. But if the, you know, if the scientific endeavor is working as it should, any peer reviewed publication should be rigorously vetted by experts in the field. And so lay readers, even if they don't understand the statistics, should feel confident in the, the conclusions that are drawn. Um, I know that (laughs) differs by discipline, but I'd like to think that at least our papers have been rigorously vetted and are trying to be written in a much more open and accessible way. And you said that this was, for for both of these, that this was almost requested by the journal. So are you seeing this as as a shift more generally that this is what's wanting to happen or at least within within your your space or you just got lucky with those journals 
I think I just honestly got a little bit lucky. Okay. Uh, I think that there are certain journals that, so for example, this this journal is uh, Social Issues and Policy Review is an uh, interdisciplinary international journal that you know wants to make sure that it is accessible to policymakers and folks that might vote on policy that aren't experts. And so it's sort of baked in. And especially with the recent editorial change, this was something that was really important to the editors to make sure that we were able to do this in a way that everyone could get access to, you know, intellectually. And with the the next journal, that um, the next article that we're going to talk about, those review papers are geared toward non-experts specifically. That's the outlet. So it is it's read a lot within psychology and within, you know, uh, higher education, but their goal was to make it so that somebody could plop that paper into a first year course or a second year course before people are experts in psychology and they would fully get it. They would know what's happening. It's not too jargony. And so that's why I was drawn to both of these journals. Uh, because, you know, at its core, that is part of why I'm interested in doing things like what we're doing right now, you know, having these conversations. I, like I mentioned off mic, it doesn't help me if I'm only talking to 10 or 12 people. I want to make sure that the findings that come out of my lab or that are in these big review papers that I do get disseminated more widely. Because I think, you know, I have confidence in their importance. And is there, and maybe you can't speak for everyone, but is, is there a fear <laughs> that if you're making it easier for the layperson to read that it is, I don't know, you're, you're not showing your scientific chops, you're not showing that you can use the, the phrases that should be used? I, I don't know. Because I also know that, that there is the whole publish and perish thing, um, or publish and, or perish, and, and that you're <laughs> trying both. to get, or, uh. Uh, and that you're trying to get funding. So, yeah, just... There is so many things that people are trying to balance up when they when they're trying to publish. Yeah, I think there are a lot of competing demands when it comes to how we want to structure our papers that are going to peer reviewed publications. I do see perhaps perhaps there's a little bit of a generational divide in it, but I think that more early career scientists are really keen on turning to venues like Twitter or social media to have conversations about their research in ways that are accessible to non-experts. And I'll admit, I don't read all of those, uh, all of the other um, early career researchers' research at all times because it's different areas. But I would like to think that they're also trying their best to make sure that they adopt a similar, broader scientific communication approach to their articles. Uh, I think it is something that only time will tell. But I'd like to think that there's a growing push towards making everything we do, whether it be just if you can actually access the journal um, article or if you can intellectually, you know, comprehend what's going on are at the forefront of a lot of young scientists' minds. Nice. And yeah, I think that's, that's the way that I would like it to be. Cause I think there's this, this real push towards like people should do their own research and, and people should be, um, be more scientifically minded but you're then really severely hamstrung if it's written in a way that unless you've done a, a postdoc, you're just not going to understand it. Exactly. And I I am all for people being more scientifically literate, scientifically literate and engaging with original research and engaging with scientific communication. But yeah, like you say, sometimes these papers are written where even, you know, someone who's in a faculty position, I'm like, what is actually happening? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that was a, a little bit of a, a detour, but I just wanted to definitely make you aware and, and others who are listening to this aware that these papers that we're going through are very accessible. And even if you have really no background in any of this, you'll be able to read and understand what is being discussed in them. Absolutely. Uh, so one of the other parts that you you touch on with this one in terms of like stigmatizing, stigmatizing weight will promote weight loss and improved health and that, that, uh, that incorrect assumption was talking about healthism. So do you want to just kind of mention what healthism is and how, how it's defined? Yeah. So when we think about healthism, we, it's always a concern when we talk about health promotion because we want to be talking about 
health not being a marker of your sense of self-worth or your sense of societal worth. And it's often a concern when people make this transition from a weight-focused uh, sort of framework to a health-focused framework that then there becomes a new class of stigmatized, marginalized, or othered folks, and those are the, the quote-unquote unhealthy. And so from our perspective, you owe no one health. Health is not a moral imperative. Everybody deserves respect. Everybody deserves full access to society. And so when we talk about you know, making this shift from a weight-focused uh, perspective to a more weight-inclusive approach that emphasizes health behaviors, we want to make sure that we're doing so in a way that respects that not everybody wants to do that, not everybody has access to that, and not everybody is capable of that. And so healthism is this perspective that, you know, now at the top of the hierarchy instead of thinner bodies or healthy people. And so we want to make sure that when we shift this, we are dismantling that body hierarchy, that we are leveling the play, playing field when it comes to access to health, but we are, are in no way yoking health to your worth. Yeah. And I think that's a really important thing because there, there are so many social determiners of, of health that are completely out of someone's control. And just as socioeconomics and, and, and status within society can make it easier for someone to be in a, in a thinner body, that's also true of, of being healthy. Exactly. Access to resources, access to time, you know, uh, not everyone has the time or the energy at the end of the day after they've worked two jobs to go to the gym, even if they can afford access to the gym. And so by no means should uh, health be considered a moral imperative. It's just something that we want to break down, at least from my perspective, we want to break down as many barriers that, that people have to it as possible. If weight stigma is one of those barriers, like I see it is, I want to make sure that we can dismantle that. If a weight-centered approach uh, to health promotion is a barrier, let's dismantle that. But know that there are, like you just mentioned, there are so many other social determinants of access to or engagement in health-promoting behaviors that we need to be thinking ways to dismantle those as, to blame, as opposed to blame someone for not you know, going to the gym after their third shift. Yeah. And so then the, the next assumption as part of the paper you mentioned was recognizing that one is overweight is necessary for health promotion. Yeah, there's this idea that, you know, things like screening people's weight or uh, screening people's BMI or even worse, sending kids home with BMI report cards, which some uh, – schools in the United States do, um, which I think is atrocious, and we can talk about that at length uh, a different time, but that they think that this is like, that the issue is that higher body weight people just don't know it. And the second that they know they're fat, they're going to be able to, you know, leap to action and engage in health behaviors and make these changes that are really going to spur health promotion to weight loss. And it's bullshit. It's it's, it's, and the literature on this is gigantic and incredibly comprehensive and incredibly compelling how bullshit it is. Um, and you, you had a paper that, that connects well with this, with that, that perceived weight status and, and risk of weight gain across the U, life in the US and UK adults. Yeah. Back in, I want to say 2015, uh, UK scientists, Eric Robinson and Mike Daly and I published this paper that, looked at how you know, perceiving yourself as overweight versus not might impact weight gain over time. And we find pretty consistently across data sets, you know, three data sets, I believe, in uh, the UK and the US, in these large nationally representative data sets, merely perceiving yourself as overweight, regardless of your BMI, regardless of your actual weight, was associated with weight gain over time. And we find, at least in, I believe, the third study of that paper, that this is in part because perceiving yourself as overweight is associated with stress eating. And to me, that really meshes very well 
with the weight stigma research that I've been doing for quite some time. And it makes sense that for folks that you know, see themselves as overweight, and we, we might be getting into this a little early, but for, um, for folks who see themselves as overweight, they see themselves as susceptible to being you know, marginalized and stigmatized and discriminated against on the basis of that identity. So this is sort of the whole weight-based social identity threat model that we'll get to in a moment. But that literature is so compelling that just simply perceiving yourself as uh, overweight has all sorts of long-term negative mental and physical health consequences from you know, physiological dysregulation to increases in depression, anxiety, and suicidality over time. A lot of robust and very consequential effects, particularly among adolescents. It seems to be slightly stronger among adolescents, although I don't know if anybody has formally tested that. Yeah. And so I, I think as part of this this assumption, it's the, the idea that if people don't know that they're over that, that they're overweight, uh, they are gonna just keep up with with poor behaviors and that's gonna lead to more and more weight gain and assist this this vicious spiral. And if I'm remembering correctly with the paper that you had that that if people were in a higher weight body, but yet they didn't perceive themselves as being overweight, they are either not gaining weight or the weight gain was much lower than, than the people who did perceive themselves as overweight. Is that, am I remembering that correctly? Yeah. And that's sort of the consistent finding across, you know, ours is one of a handful of papers that have shown a very similar finding. And exactly what you mentioned, it's that even the higher body weight folks that you know, don't, if, if higher body weight folks don't perceive themselves as overweight, their weight tends to be fairly stable across time. Uh, and I think what you kind of touched at was how this assumption is really situated on stereotypes. You know, this assumption is situated on stereotypes that a fat person must be inherently unhealthy must be engaging in unhealthy behaviors. They must not be working out. They must have a a terrible diet, you know, all these other things that for the most part just aren't true. The differences in physical activity and differences in diet quality across body weight groups is not as large as folks would like to think, but the stereotypes about it are strong and pervasive. Yeah. And I, my, my sense would be, if we're looking from a from a health perspective and looking at things that that really push the needle in one direction or another, we'd be back in the social determinants of health. Um, that that they're going to be the things that are, are most likely to be determining whether someone is is doing well on the health scale or don't, not doing so well on the health scale. Yeah, absolutely. And this kind of touches back on what we were talking about a little bit earlier, on um, sort of this need to consider things broader than the individual and interpersonal level. These social deter- social determinants of health are unfolding at a much larger, much broader level. But if we stay wedded to a weight-focused, individual-focused model, we're going to continue to come at this, you know, from a pretty erroneous perspective. Yeah, the, the whole kind of personal responsibility piece uh doesn't doesn't typically end well yeah <laughs> that uh, st- understatement of the century <laughs> um so look i, I want to then look at the the next paper that i made reference to and look at the, at the end i want to go through some of the recommendations that you would make and and, and chat about it from that perspective but i, I want to chat touch on the the other paper first and so that was called weighed down by stigma how weight-based social identity threat contributes to weight gain and poor health so you you may have touched on a little bit um just just a little while ago but what is social identity threat yeah so social identity threat is this psychological phenomena that its core is really all about the anticipation of stigma and so what i noted a little bit earlier was that Part of being, uh, of anticipating stigma is seeing yourself as a member of the stigmatized group. So this is probably why that large literature on perceiving oneself as overweight has all these negative health consequences. A lot of that is probably mediated, you know, through 
stigma related, you know, processes or stigma related consequences. We don't know that for sure. There's still an open question. But so in terms of social identity threat, it's this psychological state in which an individual is anxiously anticipates or is, you know, concerned about being devalued, rejected, or discriminated against because of their weight. And it's different than just having experienced discrimination, which is, you know, a common occurrence for higher body weight individuals. But it's sort of this anticipatory concern that can happen even outside of situations in which they're being discriminated against. So, you know, it can happen because of overhearing a fat joke at work or being exposed to TV shows where the whole purpose is to lose hundreds and hundreds of pounds in, you know, a very short amount of time while you're getting shouted at by trainers, the show which shall be uh, not named here. <laughs> um, it, there are all sorts of situations other than just being directly discriminated against that can elicit social identity threat, which is why I think it's such a important and potent sort of driver of these health consequences because, again, it's linked not just to what's happening at the interpersonal level. It's linked to broader exposures at the cultural, societal, or community levels. Yeah, and, and it's also waiting for those things to happen as well. And so it's the, it's the waiting, constantly waiting for the other shoe to drop so that someone tells a joke or that TV program comes on or you read an article or whatever. Like even without those other things, there's the anticipation, as you say, and that that means that it's pretty much just there humming in the background the whole time. Exactly. It's this constant chronic vigilance because you know it's going to happen. You just don't know exactly when or where. Yeah. You know, it's that commercial is going to come up on your streaming platform that's advertising for that terrible TV show that should be taken off air. Or you're walking, you know, across the office and you overhear somebody make uh, a terrible joke. Or like you say, one of the many articles comes across your health section of your newspaper that is reinforcing these sort of weight-centric approach and the need to, you know, engage in weight loss behaviors. There's a whole host of things that can elicit this social identity threat, and that is terrible. It just puts people constantly uh, on edge. Yeah. And I know when we were chatting at the beginning and you you were talking about the, the path that you took to – study what you've you've ended up or, or or be the researcher in in the area you've ended up researching had you come across social identity threat before but but outside of uh weight stigma uh so yeah i didn't mention it at the beginning but what really got me to this paper in terms of thinking was that same year that i read the the obesity stigma or the weight stigma review paper I read my first paper on race-based social identity threat because a very similar phenomenon happens with respect to race and stereotypes about academic performance in, in at least in the United States. Uh, there are these negative stereotypes about um, black students that they are underperformers on a college campus. And so they often encounter race-based social identity threat in various uh educational contexts. And so I had read this paper. It's a very influential paper by Claude Steele, um, an American social psychologist who's really pioneered research on stereotype and social identity threat. And I read that at the same time as I read the weight stigma review. And it, and basically in 2009, the route, the, the, the roots of this paper like started. It was I, I had read this social identity th social identity threat framework related to race, and I had read this paper about weight stigma, and I was like, "This, this is the theoretical approach that needs to be the the underpinning of this literature." It just struck me as the most the easiest way to give the weight stigma literature a little bit more of a theoretical guiding about why. Why would weight stigma, all the different ways we know that weight stigma manifests, why would that lead to health consequences? Because in the 2009 paper, if you and your readers have a chance to go and check it out, what you'll see is this beautiful review of what we know about the effects of weight stigma 
But at that time, we knew very little about why. We knew, for example, that you know, weight stigma was correlated with lower physical activity or exercise avoidance, but we didn't know why. You know, so in this paper, this 2015 paper, we argued that that's probably motivated by avoiding stigma because we know that the gym can be a, a terribly stigmatizing environment. You know, we knew that weight stigma seemed to be associated with unhealthy weight control behaviors. Again, that could have been a motivation to escape the stigma that they were in and no longer have to contend with it. But like, it was really, I'm glad that you asked that question because it, it really was this crazy confluence of a few papers and being in a health psychology lab that laid the foundation for what is now like, you know, the career that I'm talking about right now. Wow. Um, and with, I mean, you made reference to, to race there. So how does that differ in terms of um, how it affects physiology or self-regulation or psychological health? D- does it, uh, are there differences between weight stigma and, and, and race or actually because it's, it's still under that umbrella of social identity threat that it, it kind of just all works in the same way? So when we wrote this paper back in 2014, 2015, we pretty much made the argument that it would probably operate the same way. And that was because at that time, there was very little research on weight-based social identity threat where there was data, there were studies on race-based identity threat, gender-based identity threat, these other related identities that we could like look at those literatures and see, you know, what were the immediate consequences to them? Uh, I would say for the most part, they're going to, most of them are going to elicit a very similar psychological and physiological stress response. And that's going to have some similar downstream consequences, but what you're really going to see differences on are going to be the conditions that elicit it, obviously. Yeah. You know, a situation that's stigmatizing for race uh, or for racial minorities is not going to be stigmatized for um, higher body weight individuals. Um, the concern is that, and one of the things that I would like to do moving forward with our lab is more often than not, and I am just as guilty of this as anybody, we become experts in one one form of, of stigma or one form of social identity threat, you know? So I do a lot of work on weight stigma. There are other researchers that are experts in gender-based stigma or race-based stigma or sexual identity. Very rarely, and I can't even actually think of studies that have directly compared them like you're thinking, would we see a study where we randomly assign people to weight versus race versus a control? just to see. I think that would be really interesting and really important information to help us as we start to develop out our, these like models and these papers a little bit more is like, do they do the same things? And if they don't, where do they differ? But it is, you hit on a very important and like wide open question. Okay. Cause I I know obviously there's like weight stigma conferences. Are, Are there identity threat conferences? So there is the International Weight Stigma Conference, which I believe is still accepting uh, uh, submissions, but it's going to be in, for those of uh, you listening that might be of interest, it's going to be in Auckland, New Zealand from June 22nd to June 23rd. Uh, So we do have a dedicated conference for weight stigma on which I've been a member of the steering committee for a few years now, but it's really the brainchild and the baby of um, Dr. Angela Meadows. But with race and other forms of social identity, it tends to be integrated into our more mainstream conferences because those identities have been studied longer. This, you know, they, they don't face the same challenges of uh, being seen as a legitimate uh, research endeavor that weight stigma faced for the first, you know, few years that we were doing it in, in at least within the social psychology framework. Uh, I would love to put together just a social identity threat conference one day. If there's folks out there listening that are social identity threat researchers um, and are a glutton for conference organizing punishment like I am, uh, I would love to put something together that really tackles that question though, Chris, because it's so important. Like are, how do these different forms of identity threat operate similarly? 
Where do they break differently? And more importantly, I'd have to say, how do they unfold with people that possess multiple stigmatized identities? Yeah. You know, I think one of the biggest issues uh, that I see with the stigma literature right now is we tend to think about these identities like they operate in a vacuum. And again, I've been just as guilty of this. So commenting on my own work as much as anybody else's. But, you know, I look at the effects of weight stigma among people that are different races, different genders, you know, not considering how they may operate differently or not making that an explicit consideration in how we design the study so that we, you know, actually have the resources to test it. You know, we need to collect enough folks across different racial groups or across genders to see does weight stigma unfold differently across these different identities. It's just, it's such a, uh, an important and understudied area. Yeah. Well, it, it seemed like one of the papers that you were working on, You, I, I know we chatted about this before we, we hit record, that, that you were kind of brought in late on, was looking at how weight is perceived across different groups. And that if you're a man or you're a woman or you're um, black or white or whatever, you, you could be at a higher weight and be perceived as being normal weight in inverted commas, um, and uh, it, it's not an even playing field. So, so not everyone at a BMI of I don't know twenty six is thought about diff- in the exact same way in terms of where uh, the lay person lay person sees that person's body and, and and how they feel about it. Exactly, and I think that like you touch on. You know, when a certain person will be will be perceived as uh, "quote unquote" overweight differs across these different social categories. But one of the things that we still haven't touched on is, does that translate into how people perceive themselves? Yeah. You know that that paper was all about how others perceive you. So, what a really interesting question to you know pursue uh, that paper next with is, does that actually translate into your social experiences? So, do we see you know, different groups identifying themselves as overweight or not at different thresholds that sort of map onto how everybody else sees them. It's, it gets really, (laughs) and even that sentence made it sound as complex as it is. It gets really complex really quickly. um, And it makes addressing these, these questions even more challenging, but I think it makes them even more worthwhile. The closer we get to studying social identity and studying stigma in the lab as it operates in the wild, the better. Yeah. Like just looking at a single identity at a time kind of constrains our ability to really conceptualize the the rich ways in which our, uh, who we are and the groups that we belong to shape our social experiences. But from a from a scientific perspective, the more variables you add in, does it then become more difficult to work out what, what's doing what? The the biggest challenge is it just grows the size of the study. You know, if yeah. we need to, if we want to recruit people that differ across their uh, just their weight, we're talking about two groups. You know, higher body weight, lower body weight. If we add in race, then we're talking about four groups. If we add in gender to, then we're talking about eight groups. Uh, And so it's just sort of the need for resources and for participants in those studies just get sort of exponentially uh, larger, making them, which is, I assume is why a lot of folks don't pursue slightly more complex research because it's resource demanding and it's challenging, you know, recruiting across these very these various populations and so and so let's talk specifically about this paper so and just looking at how weight stigma affects different areas so so starting with and and you've probably touched on this already but anything else you want to add in in terms of how weight stigma affects physiology yeah so from what we understand uh at least from the research that's happened thus far, it seems like weight stigma elicits a physiological stress response. And so that has, you know, increases in cardiovascular reactivity, increases in the production of the stress hormone cortisol, and some evidence to suggest an increase in inflammation. 
you know, so that we are seeing all of these processes, these physiological stress processes that are associated with a whole host of uh, physical health uh, outcomes seem to be elicited from weight stigma. Yeah. And, and interesting, like all the things you described there are associated with or, or symptoms that occur with someone, say, with, with metabolic syndrome. And so there is often the disease that is then uh, blamed on the weight, but it could be the stigma. 100%. This is why I think we touched on this earlier. We need a lot more a lot more agnostic research coming out of folks doing, you know, work in metabolic uh, syndrome and related research to consider, you know, social factors or psychological factors even. Yeah. And so then self-regulation and executive functioning. How how does weight stigma impact on this? And this was when I first read this paper, this was really interesting to me because it wasn't something that was at the forefront of my mind. So it was something that we wrote about and something that there's not a ton of data on, but it uh, and there's maybe one or two papers on it at, at, at this present, but it, sort of the stress and the, the vigilance that we just talked about, you know, that this, the, these types of experiences come with a lot of heightened vigilance. And that vigilance for, you know, is the other shoe going to drop, uh, you know, suppressing and regulating the emotions, the negative emotions that come along with this shitty experience of just being stigmatized. All of these things seem to undermine our working memory capacity, you know, and once our working memory capacity is undermined, it can lead to things like, you know, increases in high calorie snacking, which is one of our earlier papers that we found that exposure to weight stigma made individuals more likely to consume high-calorie snacks. And that was actually what led us to think that maybe this self-regulation or executive functioning pathway was uh, one pathway that it could lead to, to changes in health. Uh, I think this is, this is one of the areas that's most interesting to me in terms of pursuing in the future because there are not a ton of uh, weight-related papers on this. this. We drew a lot from the uh, the gender and the race-based literatures for it. But the work that's out there so far, so far seems incredibly compelling. And the paper that you then did on the, the psychological and physiological effects of interacting with an anti-fit, anti-fat peer, um, does that connect in with this as well? Like I, if I'm remembering correctly, that there was comments around how that would impact on, on um, cognitive ability. Yeah, so we, that was, uh, in that paper, we did use a, a very crude uh, measure okay. of, uh, of cognitive ability. And so I, I consider that one piece of a broader puzzle of getting us towards understanding, like truly its effects on executive functioning. We used a, a, a word finding task which from other research has sort of been used as a proxy for your ability to engage in, um, to engage working memory. Uh, but yeah, in that paper, we did find that simply interacting with someone who you thought was anti-fat or not, um, in all cases, they were actually just a Confederate working for me, uh, interact the joys of deception research and social psychology. Um, so interacting with this anti-fat person was, was uh, sufficient to make you worry about being a target of stigma, which was associated with decreases in cognitive performance. So decreases in performance on this word finding task, but then also an increase in things like rumination, um, an increase in uh, stressfulness associated with the interaction, decreases in self-esteem, a whole host of things that should combined also predict undermined actual working memory. If we were to use a more cognitive-based working memory task. But it, uh, <laughs> I'm glad that you brought that up. I was a little hesitant, too, because our, our measure of cognitive performance there is I w- admittedly a little crude, but it does okay. sort of lay the foundation for uh, future research to use our paradigm, the interaction task paradigm, but to extend it to these more well-validated measures of cognitive performance. And have you got some uh, research in mind for that or have you applied for a grant to, to do something in this area? 
I have applied for plenty of grants recently <laughs> as a brand new as a as a brand new faculty member. Uh, but this is yeah the this sort of unpacking the cognitive consequences of weight based social identity threat is something that I'm really going to be pursuing starting this fall once I have a graduate student start. So um, a graduate student will be joining my lab uh, this fall, um, which is exciting and uh, only slightly terrifying. And uh, in collaboration with that graduate student, we really hope to dive into how these different ways that we manipulate weight-based social identity threat, you know, like reading an article about escalating discrimination, interacting with someone who you learn is anti-fat, things like this, how these different elicitors of identity threat are related to, you know, working memory capacity specifically so that we can really unpack that self-regulation or executive function pathway in, in this model. Yeah. And because it seems that there's obviously a lot of uh, just misbeliefs or uh, that, that people are lazy or they're not as intelligent or there's, there's all these things around someone being in a, in a highway body. And I, I think some of those are just complete nonsense anyway. But if that is occurring, then, then this can be part of why that is occurring. You, you hit the nail on the head with why I'm so interested in this because there is, there's actually a fairly sizable literature that makes the argument based almost exclusively on correlations that BMI is a predictor, a strong, or they, they call it a strong predictor of, of different forms of executive functioning and working memory. And just like a lot of the other literatures that are trying to make this direct effects argument it never controls for something like stress or anxiety. And it you know, doesn't come anywhere close to thinking about stigma as a possible reason. Um, and to me, that's very it's disheartening because the, I, I agree with you that that research is really kind of serving to potentially bolster stereotypes associated with higher body weight individuals. And it gives people, quote unquote, science to turn to to justify those, you know, biased beliefs or those stereotypes. Yeah. Um, and so it can be, I feel like social scientists or folks that are approaching the weight literature from a slightly more nuanced, slightly more agnostic perspective are th also thinking about the consequences in the ways that we frame our findings when we publish them or when we talk about them. As much as people would like to acknowledge or would like to assume that, you know, science is just this objective thing that happens as scientists stand three feet away and watch it happen. That is not true. You know, how you frame your findings, the places you publish your findings, the way you interpret it when you turn to the media, all of these things are shaped by your own perspective. They're shaped by your own biases and they're shaped by your own interests. And so that's why we try to approach, we try to approach all of our research from a fairly agnostic perspective. We also want to use it as a way to, um, maybe not, maybe agnostic isn't the best way, but a way that's um, open to multiple perspectives. And it's a way that emphasizes that the social dimensions associated with living in a higher body weight carry a lot of significance and probably mean a lot more than just uh, the BMI or, you know, the weight on a scale. Yeah. Definitely. And so another one was uh, the weight impact, uh, weight stigma impact on psychological health. And uh, you've obviously touched a lot on it just then. Is there anything else you would, you would add? Uh, no, I think that, that just fully realizing, um, especially for, for folks that are um, a little bit more invested in a medical model, fully realizing the relationship between mental and physical health is really important. Um, I'm sure that's not something terribly new for your listeners, <laughs> that uh, mental and physical health are uh, intimately intertwined with one another. But when we think about examining this relationship between weight and health, or at least weight and physical health, we really need to realize and account for the fact that there's this strong relationship with mental health as well. And I think that really changes or at least it should change people's perspective on on this sort of quote unquote direct relationship between weight and health. Yeah. And I know you did a paper recently called Weight Based Discrimination, Interpersonal Needs and Suicidal Ideation. 
Um, and I, I think there was two studies as part of this paper. So this touched on this uh, on the on the psychological side of things quite well. Yeah, absolutely. This is one of the most recent papers uh, out of my lab and was in collaboration with some of my fantastic new colleagues and graduate students, um, April Smith and Doreen Dodd. And, you know, we were really interested in the relationship between weight stigma, or in this case, weight-based discrimination, and suicidal ideation. Um, There's growing research showing that other forms of discrimination, so racial discrimination and sexual orientation discrimination, seem to be pretty potent predictors of um, suicidal ideations and thoughts and behaviors. And, you know, across two studies, we find that this is also the case with weight, at least, again, the caveat being this was a cross-sectional survey. Um, and so we can't be certain about the causal direction, but at least gives us initial uh, evidence to suggest that weight-based discrimination translates into uh, risk for suicidal ideation in part because it escalates depression, you know, and we know that depression is a a very potent predictor of um, suicidal thoughts and behaviors. And it also makes people feel like they are a burden on others. And I think that's a really important um, aspect to consider is, you know, when we think about well-being, we often think, or or we're getting, we're getting better about thinking well-being in a holistic sense in that we think about mental health and physical health. But what we hope to draw attention to is also thinking about social health, like our social connections, our social relationships. And if one of the consequences of weight stigma is that it's making people feel like they are, you know, a social burden on others, or in some of the other work that I've got going, makes them feel socially isolated, it's, it adds just another new way in which weight stigma is just going to exert all these awful, awful downstream effects. Yeah, and I know the the focus on the negative outcomes associated with loneliness is getting a lot more airtime. I can't remember it's like how many cigarettes a day it is if you're lonely, but it's 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 twenty or or quite a higher number. But just how much of a of a real problem this is within our society, and and if you're talking about the things that happen when people feel stigmatized, it, it's pretty much just creating that. Absolutely. And, you know, you can imagine stigma, weight stigma or other forms leading to a sense of loneliness for a few reasons. Like one, you know, it conveys being a target of stigma and discrimination conveys something about what others think about you. You know, it, it, it ostracizes you, it others you. And at the same time, you might be motivated to go out less, to engage with people less because you want to avoid being stigmatized, you know? One of the easiest ways to avoid encountering interpersonal stigma is to avoid interpersonal situations. But then you have this really nasty combination of, you know, socially isolating yourself and feeling a sense of social distance and social loneliness because of what stigma conveys. And like you say, there, that, uh, that research is just getting more and more compelling on the, the health risks, the mortality risks of loneliness and lack of social isolation or social isolation are they're breathtaking the the that research is i think one of the the most underappreciated when it comes to how we talk about um psychosocial risk factors i think that needs to be a much more prominent aspect of our conversation is like social isolate isolation is a huge driver of health outcomes yeah so look what I want to do just to finish up uh, with with what remaining time we have is just focus on some recommendations that that you would have. And I know this came up in in at least the first paper, but like what could governments and policymakers be doing? What can individuals who are dealing with other individuals and other people be doing? Um, like how how do we start to leave stigma behind, and how can we can we be better? Absolutely. I mean, that's pretty much the million dollar question. Um, so I'm glad that we're, <laughs> we're, we're ending on that and opening with it. Um, uh, but I think that it starts kind of like we've alluded to earlier. It starts from the top. It starts about thinking about stigma stemming in part from broader 
structural and social forces. And some of those structural forces are things like laws and policies that leave higher body weight individuals susceptible to being fired simply because of their weight, um, that do not protect them from discrimination in uh, health insurance pricing or other forms of discrimination, from broader societal representations. If we think about the ways that we are socialized, one of the ways that we're socialized is through um, mass media and things like television. We need to be more critical of the ways that higher body weight individuals are represented in uh, in our media. Like if we very rarely do we see fat leading characters on TV or in movies where they're just living their lives and the either punchline or the focal point is their weight. So getting better representation with respect to fat characters just living their lives like normal people struggling with normal day-to-day life, uh, you know, adult things without weight being the focal point. Um, That can help to shift stereotypes about um, higher body weight individuals that can help to provide more nuanced representations and get people to empathize and sympathize uh, more readily with um, their heavier peers or the heavier folks around them at the interpersonal level. Like (laughs) this is a struggle, but I guess don't be so shitty to fat people. (laughs) Um, uh, Try to try to uh, try to have a more nuanced view on the relationship between weight and health and try to think about how the comments that you're making, even if you think they might be positive or might be congratulatory, come off in a way that glorifies thinness or that engages in healthism. You know, congratulating someone for their weight loss basically reinforces the system that they should be seeking weight loss because that's when their body is viewed most positively. So, Quit those conversations, quit fat talk around others, quit fat talk around our kids. And at the individual level, if we're getting down to that level of of this equation, for higher body weight individuals, know that folks out there see you and realize that you are struggling with things that are embedded in all these other levels that I've just talked about. This shouldn't be you know, the, the issue of combating stigma associated with higher body weight individuals should not rest on the shoulders of the marginalized. It should not rest on the shoulders of the oppressed. So this is, you know, know that there are folks out there that are working to make these changes and hope that we can get these changes happening at other levels. But at the same time, you need to find folks that are like-minded and can be your social so, source of social support, your source of social connection, your source of resistance against this shitty oppressive system because it's not going to change overnight. And so you need to find those folks that you can get in your life and that can get you to a place of uh, happiness and uh, joy and appreciation of your body. Nice. And just for, for, for you, when did you find health at every size um, as part, like when, when you were getting into all this research, how early on did you, did you find them? So I have known about health at every size for, you know, probably five years, uh, and have kind of dug into five or six years, dug into that literature a little bit more and have read papers like, you know, really influential papers like Tracy Tilka's 2014 paper, um, I'm going to pull up the paper right now because it's everywhere. They have a paper called "The Weight Inclusive Versus Weight Normative Approach to Health." That you know, a lot of a lot of what we talk about in our our 2020 paper is rooted in in, in papers like that. And so I, I, I came to this earlier. Uh, I don't think I came to a place of fully realizing the power of the way we talk about these things or the power of language or the power of standing up for and centering fat bodies in this conversation until about four years ago. And you can see that in the language that I use in the 2015 paper. I'm mortified by some of the phrasing in there. Um, The way that I talk about higher body weight individuals or the way that even weight loss is talked about to some extent in there. Um, or, or the way that it, it loosely phrases 
weight gain as being associated with, you know, poor health. Um, I, you can see the ways that my language has changed over the past five years. And that really corresponds with my engagement with the health at every size movement, my engagement with a weight inclusive approach and my, my stronger engagement with a social justice orientation to this. Um, I think when I was a younger graduate student, I was that person who wanted to act like science was unequivocally objective. And I was just standing there on the outside watching it go by. And that's just not true. And I'm starting to stand in that a little bit more, starting to realize my own positions in this as a researcher, you know, and as someone invested in eradicating weight stigma and trying to be a little bit more, a little bit more conscious and cognizant of the ways that we go about talking about these things, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. And I, I just from your perspective, how how hopeful are you of, of the shifts that you talked about earlier on in terms of the changes that can be made and then them actually coming to fruition? So, like, if we, if we were to get into the DeLorean, how, how long do we have to travel into the future before we, we see that it's reached a point that those shifts have happened? I mean, let's just start by saying I have seen a wild shift in the past nine years of being you know, really enmeshed in this literature and really as someone who has been at the interface of uh, weight stigma and public health and weight stigma and medicine, the conversations that have been able to get into mainstream medical and public health journals when in 2011 and 2012 we were being shut out gives me hope. It gives me hope that we are, are on the correct upswing. And I also think what happens is now that the researchers are on board and we're starting to talk about it more, there's this shift in the public consciousness about this. We're seeing body positive uh, campaigns. We're seeing um, body positive, no fucks given models uh, like Tess Holiday, performers like Lizzo. We're seeing people really lean into this in the in the public sphere and so that gives me hope that attitudes will change and with changes in attitudes hopefully that we'll see changes in policies and things at both levels because you know folks attitudes about these things and representation are sort of at that middle level representation and interpersonal attitudes can you know both negatively and positively impact people downward because, you know, that's the people that are a target of this bullshit. But then it can negatively and positively impact people upward who have control over structures and laws. And so I'd I'd like to be hopeful and say that within the next five or six years, we're starting to see more protections when it comes to um, higher body weight individuals in, in terms of discrimination and things like that. I know that I think Washington state in the U S just became the second state to outlaw it at the state level. Okay. Um, so that's at least a little promising. We also have promising models from, uh, Reykjavik in terms of strategies to couch this in a social justice orientation. Um, but then at the same time, I can't be completely ominous. I can still be a little bit gloom and doom because otherwise, <laughs> why would you have me on? Yeah. Um, at the same time, we just saw a reboot in um, The Biggest Loser, which will finally yeah. be named. And it's terrible. It's, it's a fat shaming, weight stigmatizing, like negative attitude driving shithole of a TV show. Um, and that's not just me speaking. There's data on that. Yeah. Um, there's actually data on exposure to The Biggest Loser exacerbating anti-fat bias. There's plenty of data on the fact that most folks from that show gain the weight back and that the ways that they go about losing weight has just gutted their metabolism and has harmed them in the long term. Yeah, and I've so, had, at some point I had Kai Hibbert on, on, on the show to, to chat about her experience and, and what happened after she appeared on that show. And it's, I'm, I'm glad that that conversation is coming out because they, they're, they're trying to rebrand in the wellness frame that a lot of other folks are. Um, I won't completely just get a bunch of um, lawsuits at my doorstep and name a bunch of other folks that are doing that. (laughs) Um, But there are plenty of, there are plenty of organizations that are adopting and co-opting for the most part, 
wellness framing in a way that if we don't push back against it very strongly, very loudly, and very quickly, we're going to lose a lot of the ground that we've made. Yeah. Okay. So you started positive and then it went a, a little <laughs> bit downhill from there. It got a little negative. <laughs> uh, but I think, you know, we have to be realistic, but I do think that uh, if anything, we're on an, ups- uh, an upward trajectory after, you know, if we compare where we are now to where we are, you know, 10 years ago when I started. So. And are you also seeing at the level of researchers that more people are wanting to come into this, this area of, of study? Absolutely. There, there is growing interest, uh, not only in social psychology, but in um, nutrition and dietetics and public health and interest in weight stigma. You know, we've seen Angela Meadows grow the, grow the weight stigma conference over the past five or six years. Uh, and we've seen funders and agencies actually consider the impact of weight stigma for mental and physical health and do workshops on it, you know, are open to funding it. Um, Like things that were a very, very uphill battle when I started doing this work in 2011. Yeah. It was, yeah, especially from funders. It was, it was very challenging to get folks to fund this research. Nice. Okay. Well then that's, that is positive to, to hear those changes. So look, Jeff, is there anything that we haven't covered? It feels like we've been chatting for quite a while and we've gone through a lot of what the research covers, but is there anything I haven't asked you or we didn't go through? You know, I think we have had a very comprehensive conversation and I hope that it didn't end too much on doom and gloom. Um, And I hope that it was... uh, uh, I hope that it was enlightening to your readers and to, to your listeners. And yeah, I appreciate you taking the time to have me on. Thanks. Well, yeah, I, I'm glad that I did. This has been a wonderful conversation. Where can people go and find out more information about you? The easiest place to find about uh, more about my research is just jeffreyhunger.com. You can also follow me on Twitter uh, for equal amounts of snark and research, and that is at um, drhunger. Uh, yeah, those are probably the two easiest places. Okay, perfect. Well, I will put that in the show notes. And yeah, thank you so much for your time. This has been awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. So that was the episode. I I really loved it. Jeff is an incredibly smart guy, and I'm so thankful we had a chance to have this kind of an in-depth conversation. As I said at the beginning, I want to start to mention some things that I've been enjoying and that I thought you might too, and there's just one thing that I'm going to start off with. So my recommendation this week is a podcast called Hunting Warhead. So this was recommended to me by a client and I'm really glad that she she did recommend it to me and I've subsequently recommended it to lots of other people and it is very me, meaning it is incredibly dark and disturbing, which is often how I like my, my podcasts and my documentaries. Uh, it's about a child abuse website, uh, I think called Child's Play, that was on the dark web and how the police then infiltrated it and were able to make arrests uh, connected to those who were running it. So it is by no means light listening. And the show talks about some rather alarming statistics concerning concerning rates of of pedophilia. And as a parent, it makes me never want to let Ramsey go to anyone's for for sleepovers or let him ever out of my sight. Uh, I've had so many clients who've experienced sexual abuse during childhood, and these figures really put this into perspective of just how often it's occurring, and it, it really is frightening. And this show, it just really grabbed me. It reminded me of when I was new to podcasts and I first listened to Serial, and I just finally understood, A, how podcasts could be so good, um, and, and uh, B, like why listening to radio in the 1950s was was so pleasurable. I just couldn't wrap my head around it, having always grown up on TV, of like why people would be wanting to do that and how engaging could it really be. And that was the the series that really demonstrated to me actually how wrong I was and how gripping just audio can be. Uh, Hunting Warhead is, is well produced, it's well edited, it's well paced. It wasn't stretched out, but but covers everything in, in six episodes uh, which I, I managed to blitz through in two or three days. So if you're into great investigative journalism and are okay with dark topic 
material like this, then I highly recommend it. So that's kind of it. As I mentioned at the top of the show, Seven Health is currently taking on clients. If you're struggling with dieting, with disordered eating, recovery, uh, body image issues, or any of the topics that we cover as part of this show, then please get in contact. You can go to www.seven-health.com forward slash help. And I will catch you next time.